Yes. Oh, oops, I clicked the wrong button. Hold on, let's see, it says present. I think it's better. There we go. Well, thank you so much for asking me to do this. Um, it's certainly a conversation about the life cycle of a business that is the most fun because you spend your time thinking about what can be. You're not yet dealing with the things that are. A um, little background on me. Uh, I started my first business when I was nine years old. I sold my last company in 2014. I wanted to know what it was like to work at a big company. So I went to go work at Amazon Web Services where I was for about three and a half years until I left to join a venture firm here in Seattle, Washington, um, which I left at the beginning of the year and then subsequently joined Grasshopper to help them build uh, a bank for startups. Uh, also an angel investor. In so I've been around the startup uh, ecosystem for a long time, both from- Me Mihai, yeah. if I might quickly interrupt, uh, your window is showing, I guess it's the share window. And um, so you might want to, yeah, there you go. All Perfect, right. thank you. You imagine after 4,000 Zoom meetings, I know how this thing works. <laughs> but, We've uh, all I've been all there. Yeah. No, no, all good. Cool, so if it does it again, I will keep an eye on you. Um, so, I uh, did want to thank uh, a few folks as I put this presentation together um, that most of this is stuff that I've learned from mentors and friends and specifically wanted to call out Todd Vernon, who was the founder of Legit, where I was the 11th employee. Um, he's done this a lot as, as probably more than I has raised a bit more dollars than I have uh, and actually took a company public, uh, which I haven't. So a lot of this is sort of from his guidance and I wanted to make sure to say thank you before also, I don't know if the Zoom will allow it, but stop me at any time if you have questions. Um, I know we're waiting for questions at the end, but I prefer it to be a little more informal, especially since we have a small group. So there's two types of businesses that you can build. Uh, traditionally, they're known as lifestyle businesses or venture-backed businesses. Lifestyle businesses are great. They, are, they tend to be smaller. They tend to have less employees. They tend to not need investment. Uh, the economics for the founder can be a lot better uh, and they often are less stressful and can create an amazing life because you're not stuck in a have to grow really big really fast mode. Uh, venture back businesses are great. They tend to be more stressful though but you have to move fast, you build something bigger uh, and you grow faster and your outcomes can be quite large um, but they're also tricky. So uh, the thing that is interesting about a venture back business that most people don't realize is that even though you may see a company sell for $100 million or $200 million, the founder might make very little. Um, and a lot of that has to do with how money is raised during the life cycle of the business um, because that can ebb and flow. And so you don't have as much control around uh, your outcome as you do if you don't run a lifestyle business. For the sake of this conversation, I'm gonna focus on venture-backed businesses. Um, but happy to talk about lifestyle businesses too. Uh, I built one of those as well as a venture back company. So what do you need for a big company, for a venture back company? You need a big market. You need to understand uh, that you'll probably be focusing on a small part of a big market. So the bigger the market you can focus on, the better off you are. You need to have a great team and a great team has three components. Uh, the ability to articulate vision, to execute on that vision, and then the ability to pivot quickly and you need to have a smart idea. What's important about the idea is that it doesn't have to be unique. It's not important for you necessarily to have something that nobody else has ever done before. You just need something that you could do better than anyone else. So let's talk about market. Um, there are really two things that you wanna look at inside of a market. The big thing you wanna look at is for shifts that are occurring. So think about, uh, mobile, right, with the, the advent of the smartphone sort of drove an entirely new opportunity uh, for there to be multiple types of businesses within the mobile space. Cloud is a big one. Obviously, you know, my time in AWS showed that you could build gigantic businesses without ever owning a server. Um, and the opportunities to help companies build on top of the cloud were enormous and big. Um, things like FinTech, PropTech and gaming are all markets that are beginning to shift and grow, uh, that there's a lot of opportunities within them. 
And the key when you think about the major shift within a market is that it's something big that's going, that's growing rapidly that you can again own a small piece of or work within. So you could uh, build a business that's focused on managing data lakes and build a gigantic business focused just on that or on marketing automation or on 400,000 other things that people have to do if they decide to go into cloud computing. Um, FinTech, there's the obviously change of sort of the disintermediation of banking and how it gets unbundled and broken into pieces. And there are many things that you can do within FinTech uh, if there's an area of interest that you have, but the entire market is shifting and sort of how money is moving between people and businesses. Um, PropTech is real estate and sort of how real estate is managed. What's really the key to this part of the process is finding something that you love to do. So one of the things that I realized, for an example, is that even though I've worked at Amazon for four years, I'm not that interested in cloud computing. So the likelihood of me building a business inside of cloud computing, while I have experience there, it's not something that I have interest in. And it's not necessarily something that I would go after. So interwoven into all of this conversation as we go through the next few slides is it has to be something that you actually love. Right? Because the likelihood is that you're going to spend anywhere between five to seven years on this with a high likelihood of a negative outcome um, and an even higher likelihood of a very difficult path as you build that business. Um, and so you have to start with something that you have passion about. So if you could care less about mobile or fintech, um, don't try to build a business in that space, even if you think you have an opportunity that nobody else sees, um, because you're just not going to do it as well. Just not going to execute as much. You're not going to put in the effort, um, and you're going to hate every minute of it. And I can, and as an example, with my last company, we started off trying to create a way for people to read comic books on uh, online. And at the time, there were no digital books. Really, ebooks were a gigantic mess, and trying to get a book that was with images in it was even harder. And I had real passion around the idea of consuming content online and then having a discussion or community built around it. We weren't able to execute in that space and ended up shifting into understanding that the real problem in publishing, which was the shift, was that everything was going digital, but digital was hard. And what we needed to build was a product that helped publishers take their books from paper to digital. And so we built a lot of technology around that conversion process. It was just not something that I was super passionate about. We certainly didn't get as far as we could have. Um, if somebody who had a passion around digital conversion ran that business. Let's talk about the team. Uh, team is probably most important. More often than not, an investor will not invest in your idea because of the team, not because of the idea. There is a distinct belief that good teams operating in big markets will figure out something. Bad teams operating in big markets will fail. Um, and so the team matters, how the team interacts with each other, how the team interacts with investors, with customers, uh, with their overall team um, matters. And so the founding team, which tends to be two to three people, um, is really the crux of all that, the genesis of, of the success of the business. Um, I say two to three, although often you'll see founding teams that are four or larger, because there really isn't a lot of things for founders to do early on in a business. And that when you have three founders, I have found that very often one founder does not succeed to stay for the entire life of the business. They have a tendency to get out at some point. Um, and really that's because there are two distinct uh, functions that a founding team needs to be able to do. One is they need to articulate the vision and build passion around the idea. So they want to get people who are interested in working at the company, customers that are interested in buying from the company, um, and investors interested in investing in the company. And they need to be able to get out there and talk the game. So they really are what I call the hustler. And then you have to have a founder that can actually articulate the how you're going to build it, and then actually build the product itself, which is um, your hacker. And really, that founder tends to be 
a high powered problem solver. Somebody who can take uh, a little bit of resource and build something big off of a little resource. And, and resources are always in, in low supply as you build a company. Um, and you need to have somebody who can be thoughtful about how to deploy those resources uh, across the product uh, development process. That extra founder becomes necessary if the idea needs it. Like if it's a um, highly regulated uh, concept or if it's something that has deep operational needs or it's D2C and somebody needs to understand how to do supply chain or you know, et cetera. But if there isn't anything beyond the need to have somebody sort of articulate the vision and build the passion, somebody to articulate the how and build the product, then I would really hesitate to have more than two people. Um, again, the most common question asked by investors is why this team? If you can't answer that question for yourself, like why are you guys, you folks building this? Right. What 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 is it about you that makes you the right people to build this and to build it now? If you can't answer that question with conviction, then getting investment becomes really difficult. And so, uh, so really think going back to market and going and thinking about the team you build is make sure it's a market you have passion around and it's a team that have a skill set within that market and that they are able to sort of push concept forward and the idea forward and then obviously agree to all the stuff up front like who owns what what are the percentage breakdowns who's going to be the ceo who's going to be the cto try to stay away from uh shared ceo co-ceo roles those tend to be fraught with uncertainty uh investors tend to not like that because they like to talk to one person and sort of have one person who is managing the board and, and other relationships and it gets a little wonky when there's two. Um, and then the team itself, I like to look at a team as being as senior as possible. So you don't have a lot of money to hire your first engineer or your first couple engineers or product managers um, or salespeople or whatever else you need within the business. So you have a tendency to look for cheap and hope that they, they level up. Um, this is a time where actually it may be better to have less people to have one engineer versus two that is more senior and more able to get further down the path and make sure that they have a high tolerance for risk because obviously there's a high likelihood that you're gonna fail um, and reward them, give them good equity, right? You're not gonna be able to pay them. You're gonna hopefully get them as close to free as possible, but you can replace that with equity. So they get a, an opportunity to participate in the outcome of the business and everything. Three things to making a great idea, which now we've figured out the market, we've thought about the team, and now we're on the idea. And it's very specific why I did it in this order, right? When you're thinking about it from an investment perspective, that's sort of how you think about it. Is this a really big market? Is it something interesting within the market? Um, is this the team that's going to build something interesting in the market? Then the idea, the product, the prototype that you put together is really indicative of the skill set of the team. Right, what you build is probably not what the company is going to be. The likelihood that you pivot and shift and change is relatively high. And so, um, so the likelihood here is, is that I want to see how you're thinking and how you approach problems and how you're problem solving, much less than I care about what you've actually built. Unless it's got a bunch of traction and fun stuff that you know most companies don't have early on. So uh, a product that you build has to be faster, better, or cheaper than what exists in the market. It tends to be one of those three, not all three of those three. Um, and, and, it's, and it may be faster, but more expensive, but the faster adds more value, so more expensive is okay. Um, it may not be better than what's out there in the market, but it may be cheaper, which then is okay, and et cetera. Um, Painkiller versus vitamin, you'll hear this a lot, which is the idea that a vitamin is a nice thing to have, right? Like I'll take a vitamin now and again, but I don't really need it. A painkiller is something that I need in order to survive. So solve a real pain, solve something that is actually happening in the market that is an actual pain point. And if it's a pain point for you personally, even better. Um, but really focus on something that is a painkiller 
because people are much more willing to pay for a painkiller than they used to be. And be unafraid to share your idea. Talk to everybody. The thing about a successful company is never the idea, it's always the execution. And so if you're gonna execute faster, better, uh, quicker than everybody else, you'll be fine. Um, don't be afraid to share your idea. So let's talk about coming up with an idea. And I'll accelerate a little to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, find a group of trusted folks. They don't have to be friends with people that you believe in. They may be experts in an area. They may not be, um, but people that you feel are really good at ideating and coming up with ideas or giving you feedback. Share the problem that interests you. So don't, don't come up with the idea and share the idea that you have. But what's the problem that you're trying to solve? What does it interest you? This is one that I've been thinking about a lot, which is how does one get money if they need it now and have nowhere to ask? Right? I was uh, uh, at the vet years ago with my other dog who since passed away, um, and we had to do $3,500 in tests because we thought she had cancer. And I'm luckily in a position where I was able to pay that. But if I couldn't, they wouldn't have done the test. And all of a sudden, I'm stuck with, uh, with a dog that needs tests to find out what's wrong with her. And I kept thinking about how could I get that money right away? Like, I couldn't do a GoFundMe because it would take weeks. I didn't have, you know, a mom to call to get it from. Uh, didn't have credit cards to pay for it. Like, what, if, what would it, how would I get it now? So that's a problem that I've been spending time on and, um, when you share that problem to this group of friends, let them just throw out ideas on how to solve the problem. It could be any idea. It does. There's no good. There's no bad. The more, the better. So things like asking friends and family, getting a short-term loan, selling Bitcoin, uh, you know, mobilizing GoFundMe. Um, you know, tons of ideas on how to get somebody money if they need it now and have nobody to ask. And then take each one of those ideas and drill down. What would that look like? How would it work? How would it scale? Who would use it? Like start walking through all the processes. And what will happen is those hypotheses will start to indicate whether that's a valid idea or not, right? This is something nobody can use. It's going to be way too difficult. Um, you know, it's going to be a web app. It's going to be a mobile app. It's going to be text message based. It's going to be whatever. Just kind of dive into that and go as deep as you can onto each idea. Um, and then as you start to find those ideas that you really like, you start to think about building an MVP. And an MVP, as we know, is a minimal viable product. Um, you want to take that solution that really fits the better, faster, cheaper. Notice we haven't done any market analysis at this point. All we're doing is sitting with the solution and the product and the, the idea. Um, and what we want to do is be able to build something that enables us to test that idea out into the world. Um, and that MVP you build should be chess, it should be cheap, right? It doesn't, you shouldn't spend any money on it. It could be something you could build yourself or get somebody to build at a very low cost. Uh, it doesn't have to be pretty, right? It's probably gonna be super ugly. Uh, if you can build it using no code tools or um, an Excel spreadsheet, then do that. I've seen tons of MVPs that are Google Forms and and um, and slide decks, um, or they've been done in Figma or other tools. Uh, it should be really easy. So it should be simple, straightforward. Um, it should be specific, right? It is solving a thing. Um, it should be direct. And the question you're trying to answer is if anybody cares. And then it should be really simple. Um, and then once it's built, you test it. And so uh, the way you test it is you want to get it out into the marketplace and you can use survey data to get panels, to get, to, get, um, to get data from potential customers. You can use Facebook ads or Instagram ads or Google ads to get people to play with it. You can hand it out to friends, right? You can uh, tweet it out. You can do whatever you need to do to get it into enough hands that you can get people to play with it you can understand whether people want the solution to the problem um, that your idea has in there. All right, so now we have gone through thinking through what our market is, right? Is it big? Is it interesting? Do we have passion around it? 
Is it, is it something that I want to build in for the next five to seven years? I do some market analysis to determine whether uh, it is a market that can handle a business that potentially could be a billion dollar business or do a hundred million dollars in revenue. Um, you know, one thing I'll say about that, which I think is important is a lot of times people are very uh, um, excitable when they build out their financial models and you don't have to build a full financial model, but a general idea of what a company can be inside of it. Be really smart and be really specific around what the actual potential market is, like what you're, the market you're actually addressing. Because very often people will say, it's a fintech company, we're going after banking, and they'll go, the banking market is a, I have no idea what it is, a $3 trillion market. But what you're really doing is you're doing prepaid loans, uh, payday loans for college students, between the ages of 18 and 24, right? And all of a sudden that market really is a $100 million market and it's not big enough in order to build a big enough business to potentially have venture capital. So be really smart about how you think through the market and being really specific around the size of that market. Uh, we talked about the team, right? Don't do this alone, find a friend, uh, find somebody that has complementary skill set somebody who has passion and is able to articulate the passion about the product, somebody who can build, if you can both build, that's great, but somebody needs to own the building. Um, be thoughtful about the first couple of people you get involved. Um, and then we talked about the idea and how to put together the idea. And we've done all of this, we've done the MVP, we put it out there in the world, and now people want it. So we wanna go raise money. So now we've gone past ideation into funding, and so how do we get this thing funded? The most important thing about getting funded is the ability to tell your story. And you should be able to tell your story in a cocktail party, or I guess in these days over a Zoom happy hour. And, um, and you should be able to tell it with passion and with verve, right? Like with knowledge and with confidence that you understand the market the, that you understand about your team, you understand the solution and the idea and all the components of it, the numbers that are around the MVP. Um, but as you tell this story, there's really two things that matter. You can go in and try to sell the idea of the market size. We're doing something big in FinTech, it's gonna be gigantic. Most investors spend a lot of their time researching markets and understand markets and understand uh, the area you're going after probably better than you um, because they have some MBA students sitting there all day long uh, running you know analysis against it so so usually selling the idea of the market size isn't going to get you to where you have to go and then you can sell the team right but but really the investors want to experience the team they want to see you pitch they want to spend time with you they want to get a real feel for you as a founder it has a CEO or CTO, so that really comes over time. But the thing you can sell that really does move the ball is selling the pain that you're solving, right? We are helping people who need money now get money now. And this is a gigantic pain. There's more than you know, $500 billion a year that people uh, transfer between each other sort of in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion that's just inefficiently done now. And then the investors will get excited about the possibilities of what solving that pain could look like inside of the market that you're doing. Always start with the problem and then the solution. So when we talk about the problem, and again, this is the pain, who's experiencing it? Why do they have the problem? How do they solve that problem today? And why does it need to be solved? Very often people get excited about the solution to their problem but they don't answer the question why it needs to be solved now, right? Like if I'm building a venture back company, I'm trying to build a company fast and big, and therefore I need to do it quickly. And if I'm gonna do it quickly, I need money. But if the investor doesn't believe it needs to be done quickly, like it's something that can happen over you know, 20 years, then there's no urgency to get it done today. And there's no urgency for them to invest in you today. They can wait 10 years until the problem is further down. And a lot of times we get really excited about problems and solution sets and we just don't really realize or 
believe or convince ourselves that the, the problem doesn't even need to be solved. Some inefficiencies in the market exist because the market needs inefficiencies, not because the inefficiency needs to be solved. And so you really need to feel good about those four questions and the answers that you come up with each one of those to those questions in order to really get a good feeling around what the problem itself is and how to articulate that. And then you talk about the solution. So what is the solution? Why is your solution the best, right? Like what, why is what you're doing better than anything that currently exists? So it's important to know what competitors there are in the market. When you say there's no competitors, it usually means that you haven't spent enough time looking. Right? Sometimes competitors are tangential. They don't have to be exactly one-to-one. -one. Um, what does it do? Like, can you describe what it does in sentences versus needing to show a demo? I very often, when I talk to an invest, uh, a company early on, I ask them not to demo the product. I ask them to tell me about the product, right? Describe it to me. See if you can get me excited about what it is just with words. Um, if you can't do that, then your product's probably too complicated or you haven't gotten your story down yet. And then again, why are you the team to implement it? What about you makes you special and makes you the right people to build this? Because you might have the right solution, you might have articulated the right problem, you might have the right solution. It just may be that it's not you to build it. It might be somebody else. Um, and that very often is a decision that investors will make when they're talking to teams is we love everything about this. We love the market. We love the problem set. We love the solution idea. We love it all. We just can't get behind this team. And so therefore it's going to be a no. And so make sure it's again, something that you can articulate that you have confidence, you have strength behind, passion behind, um, and that you have some level of skill in the space where you've developed a team that has skill in the space that enables you to be the right So lastly, you want to talk about the money, right? Like nobody's investing because they feel good. Everybody's investing because they want to make money. So the question is, is how do they make money? Um, so understand how to articulate your economic model, right? It's, it's easy to say, oh, it's just going to be a SaaS model. Oh, it's just subscription. Oh, we're going to just charge our customers. But what does that mean? Like how much money do you think you can make? What are the key drivers of that money? How fast can you scale it? And the thing that most people forget is what, how much is going to cost to grow this business? Like, yeah, you might be able to grow a hundred million dollar business, but it might cost you $300 million to do that. That's not a business that makes sense. So be thoughtful about how, what the costs are, right? Like hosting costs and cloud costs can get really expensive really fast. Um, and we often just go, oh, we'll just put on AWS and be fine. Um, and the truth is, is that AWS is a gigantic bill for most startups. Usually the two biggest bills for most startups are their cloud bill and their people bill. So do you need 10,000 people to run this company? Can you build the company with 10 people? When Instagram was bought for a billion dollars, they had 14 people. You know, can you do that? Can you build a company that doesn't have a lot of people? So be thoughtful on the expense side. And lastly, let's, I think this is last. If not, we'll pretend it's last. Uh, what are the sources of capital? Uh, the first one is always you, right? Writing checks. It's one of the things that is most difficult about doing a startup because it is the barrier that most people face because most people don't have an extra 100, 200, 300, 400,000 dollars sitting around for them to be able to start a company. So people mortgage their houses and put themselves into bank uh, into bankruptcy and all kinds of horrible things that I've seen people spend their money on to start businesses. But very often it starts with you, right? Like if you don't have skin in the game, then very often an investor is less excited about you because you haven't put that effort in. And what most people don't understand on the venture side is that most VCs have to put in a percentage of the fund themselves. So they have to have skin in the game as well. So they believe that everybody else should have skin in the game. So, so don't, don't overestimate the need for you to put money in, but don't underestimate the requirement for you to put a little bit of money in. And that money usually is, can be cash or time. Um, obviously you can look at alternative financing models like banks and lending, 
credit cards. Uh, NDVC is a revenue-based financing uh, venture firm, but they have a product called Intro that allows you to get connected to alternative financing vehicles. So things like banks and um, and other revenue-based financing um, and other other types of of either debt financing, usually debt financing, um, that that can take you off of the equity wheel of you know, the VC side of it. Uh, the best obviously is customers, right? Trying to be able to finance your business through revenue is the best way you can possibly do it. Crowdsourcing, if you're running a product, often crowdsourcing is great because you're able to get uh, pre-sales. The downside of crowdsourcing is if you are running a crowdsourcing campaign and you're looking to raise money for a venture capitalist, the VC will very often wait until your crowdsourcing campaign is over because they'll use that as an indication as to whether people actually care about your product or not. So it's a weird game you play when you're doing crowdsourcing. Um, and then there's sort of the, the equity side, which is the three, the three steps of the stool um, or staircase. The first is friends and family, uh, often called friends and fools, because these people will give you money because of you. Uh, they often will not understand your business. They will often have very little value to you other than their money and you will often lose all their money. And so you have to be careful from a relationship standpoint, um, how you manage friends and family. Um, it's weird because you get really, really excited about your business and you really, really want it to be successful and you believe so deeply in it that it's gonna be successful and you want your friends and family to be part of that and to make money if you make money one day, but the likelihood of a friends and family around ever returning money to them is very, very low. And so you have to be very diligent and judici judicious about bringing your friends and family in. I mean, the worst thing you want is your mom mad at you for you losing, you know, her retirement fund. Uh, angels, there's two types of angels. The way I look at it is that you have rich people that like to give money and they sort of have a bunch of extra cash around and they think it's cool and they often make investments that are very emotional. Um, and they do it again because of you and the idea. Maybe they came from the same space. And then you have professional angels. Some of these people now are investing other people's money. You have angel list syndicates and rolling funds and other things that fit under the angel space. They tend to be act very much like VCs, but give small amounts like 50 to 75K, 25K. And then the VCs, which we all know about, write big checks, but usually have uh, big requirements for you to go through. They will tend to buy early on about 20% of your company. That's normally what they shoot for. And you can look to spend, to sell 30% or so of your company when you're raising money. Um, but a VC is usually gonna sit on the board. They're usually gonna be helpful to you in hiring, they should be, and helpful to you in raising additional funds down the road. So I was almost done. I think this is my last slide. Um, how do I optimize my opportunity? Here's the things to remember if you're going out to raise money after you've gone through an ideation and an MVP process. You will raise money because of you. This is, this is the truest statement ever, right? If you're a liar, like even if you're like over an estimator um, or overly passionate person, you won't raise money, right? Like it comes off weird. So it's okay to say you don't know about something to say, I'll find out and come back, or we haven't learned that yet. But always have a plan of attack. Like, we don't know if customers are going to like this, but here's what we're doing to test that. Um, have a working prototype and customer validation. The further along you are in the process, uh, the more power you have in the fundraising process. It's just true, right? The less you need the money, the easier it is to raise. Uh, know your space, your product, your team, and believe in it. There is nothing more powerful than a passionate founder. And a passionate founder doesn't have to be somebody that bangs the table and jumps up and down every time they talk about their product or is super loud. I'm a pretty laid back person, um, but I'm also very confident that I understand the things that I'm talking about. And I know the things that I don't know. Um, and I'm willing to say that I don't know and find somebody who does on the team. So be very, very confident in your knowing your space, your product, and your team. And then last thing, which is the hard one, is 
be honest about what you're going to do with the money, right? Like, what is your milestone? We think we're going to get 18,000 customers with this money. We're going to uh, get 15 months of runway. We're going to close our first five deals. We're going to get to product market fit. We're going to, um, you know, we're going to launch our first product, whatever it is, just know what you're doing with your money. Like nobody gives you money and they're like, yeah, you know, everybody wants to know a little bit about what you're thinking about your day. And thank you. That's how to come up with an idea and then go get it funded. I'd love to answer any questions. I have a quick question, Sure. What is, what is the success rate? I'm sorry, sir? Success rate? I mean, I mean, what percentage of a startup make it? So, uh, 10%? The success rate um, for small businesses, all small businesses across the board, I think it's eight out of 10 fail. I think with startups, it's probably right about the same. The thing that sh the difference between, you know, Stripe and a florist is scale. But the but the fundamentals of running a business are the same and the opportunities for success and failure. Are the same. Um, very, very few companies are lucky enough um, to be really good at fundraising so they can constantly fill the bucket every time it goes empty. Um, but I would say eight out of 10 companies fail. Mm. Okay, thanks. All right, more questions? I wanna give others opportunity before. I jump in. <laughs> Hi, just curious. Uh, my name's Joanna. Seeing what's going on in the markets lately with the emergence of more and more SPAC or blank check companies, do you see that changing or things we need to account for if you are trying to do something new or start your own thing? You know, there's two answers to that question as I think about it. One is, um, the markets are so weird, like the actual public markets are so weird right now. And so much of the public market drives uh, things like endowments and LPs which drive VCs and drive angels who are investing their own money. Um, so it's hard to say, but I will say in general, the enthusiasm around startups has stayed high. Um, and that the amount of money raised, like the one of the things that's interesting is that there was a ton of money raised in the venture community um, because there was an expectation of a recession hitting. And I don't think anyone expected it to be what it is today, but there was an expectation that we were coming to a wall, that we we're going to hit a wall. So there was all this money being raised. All these VCs still have all that money. And the public market's doing really well right now, meaning that all that money is still callable, it still exists. So um, the opportunity to start a company, I think, is greater now than it was 12 months ago. Um, and the opportunity to be successful is greater now than it was 12 months ago because you have a little bit more time to experiment and test and grow. You do need to focus on revenue a little bit faster than, you, than in the past. Um, but that the truth is, is that some of the biggest companies are built in recessions, and this is such a unique situation financially that I think the opportunity for success is greater now than it's ever been. Thank you. I think there's a question that came in. Um, How is the market for B Corp, green energy? See. Yeah, so B Corp is really just, uh, it, it's technically, from what I understand at least, it's technically not a real designation like an S Corp or C Corp. It basically means that you're going to operate in a certain way, a certain level of transparency. Um, and so most investors don't care one way or the other, right? Like how you want to operate your business is how you want to operate your business. Uh, on the green side, I think right now there's a huge push for climate-related investment. So I think there's a lot of interest in climate right now, um, especially as you know, California burns and 
uh, and the world's going to hell. I think there's a lot more interest in climate. Um, so there's a lot of investments going on in that space. I'm seeing more and more of it, and I'm certainly uh, seeing more and more investors turning to being climate specific. Uh, my friend Josh Feltzer, who started a fund, um, Freestyle Capital, just left to start focusing entirely on climate. And I don't think that's the first big, you know, move you'll see into the into the space. So I, I think if you're interested in climate, you should go after it now um, and and be aggressive. Isha, was that the question? Did I read it right? If you want to add anything to it, feel free to go ahead. You're welcome. All righty. Next, anyone else? Okay, then maybe I'll ask. Um, okay. Your most memorable, there, this is another one that came in in chat, your most memorable experience pitching to a venture capitalist. So my last company, we pitched to over 100 and got 91 no's. So, um, you know, so certainly, uh, certainly exciting. My favorite no that I've gotten that I always say was my favorite no was uh, I was pitching a VC who said, and I actually told this story last night, uh, who said to me, uh, and remember my company was around comic books, right? Like putting comic books digitally. He goes, I love comic books. He's like, I've been reading comic books my entire life. In fact, my son loves comic books. I read comic books with my, my son love everything about what you're doing. I'm never going to invest, go pitch. And that's how he started. And so I pitched him knowing that he was going to say no through the whole thing. Um, we're still friends to this day and uh, I still appreciate his honesty. Um, I've pitched in weird, like you, one of the things that's tough when you're in a business that isn't doing particularly well, and there was times when graphically wasn't doing particularly well, you're willing to pitch anyone, anytime, anywhere. And so you end up having these sort of strange situations where you're pitching somebody who's like the great grandson of some famous person who happens to be rich and thinks perhaps that investing in startups is cool. And you try to have a natural pitch, like where you're going through your deck and you're doing it like the way that everybody teaches you and says it's the way you're supposed to pitch. And it's like you're having, you know, you're pitching over locks and bagels and, and it just, there's no slide projector, you know, there's nothing. And so it becomes a very strange thing, but, but Jeff sort of, uh, you know, being very clear, he's going to say no before we even started. It's probably my, my favorite. No. Chelsea, was that good? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Awesome. Anyone else? Hi, this is Erica. Uh, yeah. Once more. Um, yeah, so so my question was, um, you know, you're talking about kind of getting the pitch going for uh, potential investors and really setting it up, you know, with the problem statement so that they really understand the problem. How do you find that that material then translates as you start to talk to potential clients? The clients are the ones that are feeling the pain. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so the, so I found from a sales perspective, so the, now you're shifting into a sales role. So yeah. I have found that in a sales role, what you want to be able to do is build a rapport and a connection, meaning that you understand them and their problems. And that most people that you're selling to, depending on size of the organization, et cetera, are usually have somebody they're reporting to. You know, even the CEO has to report to the boss. Mm -hmm. So everybody wants to look good to whoever they're reporting to. So the question is, do you understand their problem? Can you articulate that you understand their problem? Can you solve their problem in a way that makes them look good to their boss? And if you can do that, then the cell goes a lot easier. Um, I think what happens very often in a sales deck is you get into solution really quickly because there's an assumption of the problem, right? Like you wouldn't have asked me to come pitch you if you didn't already have this problem and think that you could solve it. And so, um, so you skip the problem. 
But what I have always liked to say is like, what I think I hear from you, what I think we've discussed here is that what you're trying to solve is this. Is that what you're trying to solve? Because if you are, I have the right solution for you. If you're looking for something different, then we may not be the right solution for you. And it allows you to have a very honest conversation. Yeah, so really taking that problem statement, but personifying it for the client basically and getting their affirmation before jumping into the pitch. I was just curious because there is a relationship there, but I think there's two different pitch processes that go on with those two. So I just wanted to get that clarification. From. Yeah. yeah, no, great question. Awesome. Anyone else? Okay, then maybe I'll ask one. Um, how does one know to take that big leap of faith? Maybe I have an idea. I've been working on, um, on, I've been hustling and working on this prototype to build a prototype. But at some point, one has to kind of, again, take that big leap of faith and do it full time. When do I know that I should do it? Great question. Um, and it's a really hard answer. I think about it a lot, like uh, like taking a bite of pizza. You're like, I'm not sure if this thing's gonna burn me, but I really want the pizza. So do I wait until I know it's cold and by the time it's cold, I'm not gonna enjoy it? Like when is the perfect time for me to bite this pizza? Like you can't know the exact time. So you take the shot, right? You go, I might get burnt. Turns out that if I get burnt, I'm gonna live, right? Like my life will exist, I'll enjoy myself and, um, and I'll learn a lot from the experience. I'll learn to wait two minutes instead of a minute and a half. And so I think that that jumping into it is the same thing. There is no right moment. I mean, mm -hmm. you should have enough money in the bank to live for six months without needing any money, right? You should, you know, have health insurance. You should have things in place to make sure that you don't accidentally kill yourself, you know, stuff like that. But but the actual like jump, the moment you jump, there isn't a perfect time. Yeah. It just has to be that you're ready. You're ready yes. to be get burnt by the pizza. Sure. And as a follow-up to that, um, when do I know it's a good time to raise money? And there, there have been some instances where people maybe have bootstrapped all the way. Not that many, but some to maybe an exit. But um, what, when do I know that I should go out and raise money? So the best time to raise money is when you have figured out that your product sells itself. And that doesn't mean that you don't have to do marketing or sales. It means that that process is somewhat optimized. So if you have a product that has a six month sales cycle into the enterprise sales market, you just know that it's gonna be about six months. Like there really isn't a way to turn it into three months. So the closer you are to really understanding what they call product market fit, right? Like that there is really a customer there's two things. One is, is product market fit, that, that the customer really wants it, that you have figured out the right solution to the right problem. And then founder product, or founder company fit, right? Like this is actually what you wanna do for the rest of your life. Because you're making a commitment. You're saying, I'm gonna build this thing until it ends, however it ends. And that could be five to seven years. And so mm -hmm. if you enjoy the building of the prototype and the testing and the screwing around and all the early stuff, um, but don't want to actually build a company, don't raise money. Just build mm -hmm. things, put them out in the world and see what happens. Um, yeah. But if you, if you want to go through the entire process, make sure it's something that you are willing to commit to, A, and then B, the closer you are to product market fit, the better. Um, a lot of people can't wait that long, right? Because for lots of reasons, you want to raise money earlier because you need the cash. So when there are wisps, smells, feelings that you're moving towards product market fit, um, that's the right time to raise money. Knowing that you're going to give up more dilution early, um, the less you have of a business. The more you have customers and revenue and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the less you need the money, the less of your company you're going to sell, the further you're going to be in. Thank you. Right, back to you all. If you have anyone else have any questions? 
Um, I have an, another question. This is Erica. Um, when people start uh, companies, or in your experience, when do you start to, um, like if you have another job and you're working in another job, how does that balance work out? And, and what do you recommend? Because I know starting a company, you need to put a lot of mind share to that particular passion. So you'll hear a lot of answers to that. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, is very into sort of the hustle idea of you work your nine to five, then you work your company from six to two a.m. and and that's how you build a business. And and I believe for some people that works really well. Um, I think for others, you still have to live, right? You have to live a life, and so. Um, you commit a certain number of hours to the business that you're building. And then when you feel like that business can support you, either you've saved enough money uh, to live on it for a while, or, um, or you have some indication that you can raise money um, or some indication that customers will pay for it. Uh, then you take that jump, right? You give yourself time. And, and, and as a founder, the one thing you will never have enough of, and nobody can ever give you is time. And so you want to build that into your life. But, but I uh, believe pretty strongly that you don't burn the candle at both ends, um, trying to make two things work. And so at some point you have to make a decision as to which one you're going to do. And either way, it's going to be hard, right? Either you're giving up security or you're giving up a dream. Um, and so it's highly personal decision at the end of the day. Thank you. Cool. Well, we're at the top of the hour, unless um, anyone else has any questions. We can wrap it up. Regina. Thank you very much. Super compelling presentation and your dog's really cute as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, look forward to uh, being connected. And uh, thanks for being a resource for women in big data. And Such, again, thanks for uh, putting this on. Of course, my pleasure. And just want to say, Miha is someone I tremendously respect, not just as a professional, but everything that he does for the community. So thank you again for taking the time to, to be with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed and, it. Um, yeah. All right. Well, Thank you for joining us. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.